start that. Okay. So, um, today we're talking about the life of Adam and Eve. We, um, originally I had it in my head that the Latin version was the like primary manuscript. And then after I read it, I read, well, I read the English translation of the Latin and I was like, this is very Christian. I guess that makes sense that the Latin one would have the most Christian, uh, editing. Yeah. So then I went and actually looked at the other English translations that were on that website that I hadn't, I, initially I only linked you directly to the Latin one, but, um, the same like Virginia education hosting site had translations of a Slavonic manuscript, an Armenian manuscript, a Georgian manuscript, and a Greek. Um, so I went and looked at those as well and ended up, I did link them all last night or yesterday afternoon. I put all of those links also on the website, but it was late in the game. So if you, you know, it's like three o'clock. Yeah, I didn't realize it until I got to 42. Yeah. And, and then they started talking about Christ. So I figured, hmm, that doesn't sound very Jewishy. Well, from what Wikipedia said, the Greek one, the Latin one had most of the Christian stuff added on to it. And the Greek one was the one that had Eve's version. I mean, the Latin one just left out Eve's version altogether. Yeah. But I haven't read, I didn't read the Greek one, so I don't know. So the Greek I one. Reading, but I never oh. saw Christ mentioned. You never saw Christ mentioned. That was the link. That was the link. I didn't get to the end. Oh yeah, it's at the end. Well, in fifty-three, they prophesied the coming of Christ. Yeah. So in the Latin about. version. Um. Let's see. Fifty-three is that we said so. History of the Stellae. I don't really know what that word means. Um. A yod. A yod? It's a, it's a pointy thing that writes. No, it's not exactly a yod. Okay. Like a stylus. <laughs> yeah. Like a stylus. Um, yeah. So then, so that's the section. And then 53 says, on these stones was found what Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied before the flood about the coming of Christ. Right. Behold, but the Lord will go, come. But even if you go back to 42.2 and 3, they talk about Christ. Yes. Explicitly, though? I think the so. The resurrection of the body oh, of Adam, of the bodies of yeah. the dead. The, the, oh, the very son of God, when he comes, will be baptized. In, oh, I thought they were referring to Adam when they said that. I he think maybe forward. I did, too. So the other versions, the Slavonic, the Armenian, and the Georgian are also all very similar to each other. Those three are very similar. Um, and they have a lot of this, like, you know, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit messianic language, but it's not explicitly about Jesus, um, necessarily. Uh, so it's, it's like a little bit vaguer. It's possibly about, or it's possibly still written by early Christians, but or early followers of Jesus who still consider themselves Jews, you know, like kind of bridging that gap. Um, whereas the Latin one clearly has been edited by the church. Um, and the Greek one is less so too. The Greek one is framed as, so it's called the Apocalypse of Moses. And the first line is, um, that this was part of what of the revelation Moses received on Mount Sinai. But then the rest of it is all the same story about Adam and Eve. Um, and the the beast and the and Satan. I thought that was interesting, this distinction that appears in all of the manuscripts about Satan, the angel, the wicked angel or the, the adversary, whatever, versus the serpent is like the tool of Satan, but it's not Satan embodied, which I was sort of, I think often how it's presented. Um, but that, but these, 
stories all make a very clear distinction. Um, and then, yeah, and then the, the Greek one also doesn't, um, doesn't get into to Jesus so much. It has more of Eve and it has this angelic liturgy. So all of them have a section called angelic liturgy, but the one in, I think the one in the Greek is the longest. It has the most, yeah, Eve arose. It has the most actual like praying of the angels in it. Um, so yeah, did everyone just read the Latin one? Yeah. Yes. I read it in English. <laughs> <laughs> and he admits it too. <laughs> now, Latin's a little rusty. It's been many years. <laughs> um, so it's interesting that none of them, none of the transcripts or the manuscripts that have been found are in Hebrew or Aramaic, but that the, the scholars are still pretty sure that they were originally at some point in one of those two. Um, say some someplace, well, might, maybe near the end, maybe it was a postscript or something that it, they think it was written maybe in the first century or between the first and third centuries. Yeah. Talk about the destruction of the second temple. What was that? What was that? I think they mentioned the destruction of the second temple. Yeah. But if it's, they mention a lot of things, especially the Latin version mentions things that clearly like they're being prophesied, but like it was written after all those things happened. So, yeah. They also, they also never talk about Cain again. In the Latin one, he yeah. comes up, or I guess he doesn't really come up, but there, there is. Um, well, it does say that Cain kills Abel, but then it doesn't talk about what happened to him. It's not his story. And yeah, then they don't ever mention, then it's all about no. Seth. And all but, it says is that, therefore, we, we beget Seth to, to, to replace Adam, uh, to replace Abel. Abel. But, okay. And after Adam dies, they bury Abel and Adam together. So at least one of the versions, let's see who else might mention it. Yeah, they all say, that's the only other time Cain is mentioned, that when, when Adam dies and they're going to bury Abel, it says, like, because also his body's just been chilling since Cain killed him. Um. Oh, that's not in the Slavonic. It's in the Greek, the Armenian, the Georgian. Is it in the Latin? Yes, it was in the Latin. Yeah. If Adam was 930 when he died, how long had Abel been hanging around after he, after he was killed? <laughs> right. Well, I think, doesn't it say it was 130 when the, when, when he and or Abel were born? Yeah, a lot of the math doesn't really right it didn't make sense work out though because like it talks about wait where was that part where it says who he's when how old he is when he begot um Cain or Abel whichever one was first I don't remember now Cain he's no. too young like it doesn't make sense. I always thought they were twins. Twenty-two years old or something like. If you if you subtracted one number from the other, somebody was twenty-two years old. I don't remember who it was or when, but I got that when I subtracted one hundred and thirty from something else. Something something was twenty-two years old. Right, <laughs> which I I get. I mean, oh, that's I obviously not too young to have children, but considering like, I don't know. I guess however long I thought they were in the garden, it just didn't feel like it matched up. Well, how do you figure the age of somebody who's an adult when he's formed anyway? That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, he, he walked right away and brought her grass. Yeah, yeah. Well, Cain did. Yeah, yeah. Cain, yeah. that's 
death of Abel. So the main question I had when I read this, the Christian stuff aside, because I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and think that that was added after it was written. Why would the original have even, we, we wondered why things were in the Apocrypha and not in, not, not in the Tanakh, whatever word we were using, um, not canonized. Why was this even considered Apocrypha? It, I don't, I don't know what it added to our knowledge or anything. And that, uh, you know, it, it, it just, it didn't have the same oomph that, that the thing we read last week had for me anyway. Yeah, that's a good question. I think, I mean, I guess the Tanakh doesn't give us anything about what happens after the expulsion. We, I guess we know that they have at least three children and that Cain kills Abel. But it doesn't really tell us anything about their life or you know also, where they, they had to work hard for their for yeah their, and that's all this, it said but this one didn't really say any more than that right and this one they, doesn't say much about their life they one went west one went east and then they came back together and sat in the river again yeah, it they, adds a lot of like emotional response to the expulsion i mean we don't really yeah, get to see true. that in that's the Tanakh, but this tells us about their distress and they wanted to um, you know, their attempts at penitence, Eve's second failure at that. I, I have to say, like, I was a little disappointed the way the, like, Wikipedia article or whatever said, like, this has more of Eve's viewpoint in it. But then the, the parts we get more about Eve is still, like, she's dumb and guilty and, like... It's all her fault. She it's still all her fault out. and... Twice she falls for the Satan, um, and I did say it was the Greek version that that had her story. I mean, the Latin version that we read, it, she tells her kids to write it down on tablets twice, but then she doesn't tell the story to us. But according to Wikipedia, the Greek version tells more of her version of it. But I I didn't read it, so I don't know. What? So what uh, do you think? Yeah. Oh. No, go ahead. What's the point of the serpent fighting Seth and then telling him to, the Seth tells him to go away. And so he goes away and the wound heals immediately. What's all, what's that all about? It's a good question too. I thought that was a strange scene. Although I liked, I liked part of that um, section. Ugh, where is it? I think that that, that that seemed to be a follow-up to that part where God told the angels to worship Adam because he was made in God's image. And right. that, that's what Satan didn't like. And then when the beast bit Seth, and that's what Seth said, how dare you bite me? I'm in God's image. And the beast went, oh, yeah, I guess I shouldn't have done it. And <laughs> took it back. Oops. <laughs> I, <laughs> My bad. <laughs> But I like it's, it's in uh, it's the 30s, 37. Yeah. Oh, 30s. OK, so in the Greek, it's in the 10s. OK. Um, well, hold, all right. So let me look at the Latin. The illness encounter with the beast. But I liked that first Eve tries to reprimand the serpent and the serpent is like, e like you brought all of your pain on yourself it's your fault i'm cursed to crawl on my belly like and now you're mad because i'm biting somebody's ankle like what else can i reach this is your fault and like i don't know i thought that was a funny response i, I kind of liked that part but then seth who is so good and holy and whatever um okay so that's yes. kind of what that's what I got out of it, that he's so holy that the serpent went away, but there's nothing really in here that talks about how holy he is, except- Well, he's allowed he, back into paradise, isn't he? No. I don't see that. If he and he go back in, 
into oh for sure right he's not allowed back in to live but he like on his merit they're allowed to get the ointment oh, or whatever it. for they're allowed to ask oh, for they don't they, get it they don't get it and it was adam who's allowed back in to like see what heaven's all about and then gets cast out again oh, yeah. so i mean i guess seth is holy he's there he takes care of his parents he listens to them he, yeah he it's pretty sketchy information it is all very sketchy information um so why are you not a, afraid to cast yourself at the image of god but dare fight against it why have you two failed he I also think that adam I, not express anger at eve for what she he didn't she blamed herself more than he blamed her until the end when he was dying and then he let her have it but but he was nice to her up till then seemed like yeah but she's so hard on herself very hard on herself for 900 years Oi. Oi. <laughs> um well i was gonna say something else about seth Oh, I thought it was interesting that Seth and all of Adam's children apparently don't know what pain is. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, that's that's also that strikes me as very uh, Christian. You know. Um, you know that we experience pain and stuff because of the original sin. Well, I mean, to some extent, I think that is also. Jewish and in the or yeah that it's like part of it's a pretty straightforward exegesis of the there we go of the um canonical story right that like because it, because of this sin they are cast out and, and this is like now you will toil and have back pain, I mean, right, like, you, by the sweat of your brow, the woman will have labor pains, all these things um, that kind of implies there wouldn't have been any pain or discomfort in the Garden of Eden. But then, like, my confusion is, if Seth, if all of the children are born outside of the Garden of Eden, then why haven't they experienced pain yet? Especially like, why is only Adam in pain? Yeah. Uh, maybe they're waiting to see if they follow the laws and if they don't then boom back pain <laughs> <laughs> and now we've discovered this the source of back pain and labor pains and labor pains and all like matter of sin And, uh, and yeah, how about the seven, the seven, was it seven parts of Adam or eight parts? Seven. The very end, yes. Yeah. That was interesting. Oh. That was uh, octopartite. Octo yeah. I mean, it was, so, when I read that, I thought about that, that prayer you read on Shabbat, where we're thanking God for all our different parts. Mm. And, here, all the parts are, are, you know, sort of evil, and and it was so different from from what to me is the Jewish view of the body. Yeah. Well, they're not all evil, though. I, I mean. It's about well, uh, not dynamic. evil, not not good. They're sluggish, aimless, um, covetous, immoderate, fickle, and beautiful. <laughs> beautiful, pleasing, knowledgeable. Well, the knowledgeable part, yes, is good, but yeah, and then the Holy Spirit. 
Ruach. So the only people that have Holy Spirit are bishops, priests, and saints, and the elect of God. The rest of us, um, who knows? I don't know. Overall, I was a little disappointed in, in it, to be honest, from what I thought it was going to read like. It was kind of interesting to me where it talks about when Cain is born, he, he, it says that at once the infant stood up and ran out and brought some grass with his own hands. And I, right. that, that had a striking image yeah. of yeah. a newborn doing that. I thought of that. What was that, that show? The baby on Alec. That's, that's exactly what I thought. Yes. <laughs> the witch. A little baby image that used to show up on Al Ally McBeal. Oh yes, 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 ah, yes. Yeah. That yeah. went with it, but that's that, and that's exactly the happened? image that I had. But I wondered what the grass was for. <laughs> no. Unless it was marijuana. I assumed it was. Uh, Bedding? Yeah, to like pack her womb. It's a phrase I see in like the red tent and things. I don't really know what was used or how it was done, but to staunch the bleeding. That was nice of him. Plant material. Like with... yeah. In the next section. Let's so put some dirt in her open room. <laughs> next section of Death of Abel. It says, after Adam begot Seth, he lived for 800 years and begot 30 sons and 30 daughters. And I kind of lost, uh, is that Adam lived for 800 years and did the begotting or Seth? Because it sounds the way it's written like it's Adam, but I'm not. That's, that's, how, I, that's how I understood it, that. That actually, yeah, I, but the count was off because it sounds like Adam had 31 sons and 30 daughters, yet he had 15,000 children that came when he was dying. Yes, that was another one of the moments where the uh, numbering didn't work out. So at first I was like, okay, well, gather about me all my children that I might bless them before I die. And they numbered 15,000 men, not counting women and children. And I was like, okay, well, maybe that concludes like grandsons. Like, yeah. That's not uncommon yeah. for, you know, the favorite grandsons to also be included. And like, still like, okay, that's a lot for one generation, but, or two generations, but whatever. But then Eve gathers her children to her and it does, it's just the 30 sons and 30 daughters. And so then I, I'm just not really convinced of that math. Well, then like, he has 60 and Adam has 15,000. Well, I, I saw, I saw, I think it was Cain and 30 sons and, and his other 30 sons and 30 daughters. So there was a, the counts were all over the place. Well, the right. 63, I thought, were Cain, Abel, Seth, and then the, the other 30 sons and 30 daughters. If you had 30, if you had 60 offspring and they each had 60 offspring and they each had 60 offspring, you probably wouldn't take too long to get to 15,000. Yeah. I don't remember, exponential grows quickly, but I can't, I'd have to sit down with a computer and- You stopped it too. <laughs> you didn't live for 900 years. Yeah. That's what David, David pointed that out. I said, poor Eve, she gave birth to, to 60 kids. And he said, well, she had 900 years to do it. And I said, it's easy for you to say. <laughs> yeah. So 60 times 60 times 60 comes out to like 218,000. Yeah, so all three generations would all it take, would be all it takes. Well, it's 30, it's 30 pair, 30 couples. So you'd have to. Anyway, if so you divide that by two. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, it won't take long. Um, oh. Juliet, I can't believe you don't have any comments.
Okay. Nada. I am having a hard time feeling that this matters. Feeling that this story at all? The, the study of Apocrypha matters. I'm not feeling that this is any better than just Midrash. The, yeah. Some of it I'm not sure is... I, like, I don't really know that this is different than Midrash. I guess what makes it different is the intent with which it is written and the time period that it's written in. Um, that this was written before the, at least it, the base text was written before the rabbinic age and the concept of Midrash, and that it was probably written with some intention of canonization. That there was some faction that hoped this would replace the version we have in our Tanakh. If this was my scriptures, I would have a really hard time being a Jew. <laughs> well, I struggle with the Torah as it is. I just say, well, okay, it was written a long time ago. And I try not to think about it too hard. But this is also written a long time ago. Okay, so setting aside the like explicitly Christian stuff, what about it is harder to swallow than the canonical Adam and Eve story? After the expulsion not it doesn't replace before the expulsion it's after the expulsion when i i look at the torah i've got a book that get, explains everything that gets us to to the key story that defines us as jews the exodus right and then we get the exodus which I think that story defines us as Jews, that we were slaves and God made us free. More than anything else, that's that's defines us, who we are. And then the rest of it is maybe records and, and lots of laws, plenty of rules and laws that were applicable to those people then. So, and that nothing in Genesis can be proven historically. Actually, probably nothing in Exodus either. Nothing in the Torah. <laughs> um, I like the idea that we were slaves and God made us free. He didn't give power to our army so our army set us free god directly intervened and made us free by standing up to pharaoh all by himself and and letting us get away is the story i like this story it's a nice story it's a good story even if it is violent it's not Jews being violent it, or Hebrews being violent. It's God being violent. He can do whatever he wants. So I don't have a lot of concern about what's in Genesis because it's just, it's just leading up to the big story. Um, and the stuff that comes after the history and the laws It gives, to me, it gives history and depth because when we look at who we are as Jews right now and what we do right now and compare it to then, then we have perspective of our growth as people, as a people, as a community. There, there's a lot of things that happened between then and now, but to know, to understand all that change, we have to know the then. 
So there is 100% of the value of the Torah to me. The individual laws, the individual stories are like, okay, whatever. They are what they are. But to dig deep into this stuff about who had how many children, why a father can have more children than the mother when there wasn't anyone else to be with. Um, I don't understand how that improves anything. <laughs> There's enough story. We don't need more story. When you read uh, Genesis, you're not curious about what happens, how they, what, like how they felt about the expulsion. My, well, that goes back to how old were they when they were kicked out? The way the story reads, they could have been a week old. It's true. So it's like carrying what, what um, Glenn Youngkin and, and Terry McAuliffe did when they were toddlers. <laughs> Who cares? It has nothing to do with their politics. We're not voting on that. Has that been part of the campaigning at all? No, but it shouldn't either. So do I care a lot about how they felt in those first few days? Probably they were in a constant state of shock and surprise. That's true. If, the, if we are buying into this whole story that the earth was actually built in six days, yeah. <laughs> um, which I think a lot of us are a little too science oriented to, to think of this as anything other than a nice story. Well, or that a day was not a day. A right, day exactly. Right. Not, not 24 hours, it was... It was whatever, whatever on. Day, day could have been a year or whatever. Whatever yeah. metaphor you choose to let it represent. But, and the same with Adam, but I know this is not the point you're making, but he may have been six days old, but he was never a toddler. He was born full, full as an adult, yeah. enough to know that he was in charge of all those animals and in charge of all those plants and in charge of everything except the tree and so he, he he had knowledge at least that much knowledge when he but that's not the point you're making the point you're making is is that's not the part of the story that's important to you is the point you're making i think is it relevant? the only part of the story that's important to me is that it's a statement about how we chose to have free agency and not be controlled by god that is the only part of that whole story that really resonates with me. That but what if that was the whole story? What if it just what if there was just a sentence that said, we we, you know, the Garden of Eden was set up for Adam and Eve. They were told to just enjoy it innocently, but they chose to make the decision to to um, know what they were doing, and therefore they were kicked out. But it doesn't. It doesn't make for a good book. <laughs> okay, it's not it. as poetic. But does this does this apocrypha really help you understand? Not this one. No. The core no. element of the story. Not no. this one. No, no and I would doesn't. argue that probably most of them wouldn't necessarily help us understand a core element of the story, but a core element of the. Second Temple Jews, and this one doesn't even really do that because it's clearly been so edited by the early church. So it was a little little bit of a miss on this one. Well, but it's it it is another interesting look at apocrypha that that you know and that that led to my question of how did this even make that category and yeah. And so it's, it is interesting from a historical point of view, what, 
what was building on this literature of Jews past the Exodus? I mean, now we're here, like you said, Juliet, I think that that the rest of it is history that illuminates who we who we were and how we grew to where we are today. And that's part of it, I think, is it's it's got nothing to do with who I am, this story, but it's got to do with with my history that that I see past I Exodus. I and think peace. I think part of the trouble with identifying Apocrypha and like why it's classified as Apocrypha is that like by by definition it's a category of exclusion. So the only thing that really makes it Apocrypha is that it's from it's presumably we don't even really know where where it was written because we only have the translations really like it, if the scholars are correct and it was originally in a semitic language that that's lost so um but pr based on their assumptions that there was an original written by second temple jews or or immediately post second temple jews in the middle east um, but it wasn't, it's not the version that's, that was canonized. That's what makes it apocrypha. But if the, but like what we have now, as I said, has been so heavily edited and, and retranslated and everything that this doesn't, none of the versions I read really, like the Latin one is the most explicitly Christian, but none of them really read like Jewish texts to me. Um, so yeah, there's no there's no laws set down there's no yeah there's nothing that feels like it actually represents like tobit didn't really have a lot of laws or whatever but it i felt like it really gave us a clear sense of early diaspora jews like what was important in that first exile and even if it was written in the beginning of the second exile the fact that it was set in the first, like, I just felt like there was so much else that we learned from about, like, our, that period of our people's history um, from that story that I, I did not feel was gleaned in this one. So I guess that's a lesson um, not to just trust Wikipedia and that for our final week, we'll pick a story that's in my book of attested Jewish annotated apocrypha. Um, and then I will have all of these notes and history explanations for you to better. <laughs> okay, better so, so apocrypha then, it, so maybe that's what, the word apocrypha just means basically, at least in this case, non-canonical. Anything written in that early history that was not canonized. So nobody picked second best and put them in the apocrypha category. It's just apocrypha covers everything. So if somebody finds a scroll someplace that, that um, I don't know, a, a 16 year old shepherd wrote on his day off about, about some you know made up a story about david or something it would be apocrypha but the, the the so what happened here was that somebody has picked apocrypha that are is worth our time and whether or not we think it is or not that's that's what's happening yes there is one thing that is really problematic about this particular thing we've been reading that is very inconsistent with Torah. And that is in Genesis, with the possible exception of Noah, everyone is really flawed and broken. I mean, Abraham is not a great guy. He lies, he's gonna kill his son. Isaac's not that great. Um, the whole thing with Jacob and Esau, I mean, Jacob is not a great person. Joseph is 
a little starts out as a braggart and ends up being kind of sneaky pulling one over on his brothers his brothers are not that great um you kind of feel by the time they're slaves in egypt god is punishing them for just being lousy people um (laughs) and that maybe 400 years of slavery is to break them of their badness and then the other 40 years of okay you're free but there's some conditions you need to get with the program that by the time they get to the promised land they are not the same people that left egypt but you never get in genesis this idea that you're reading about perfect wonderful people you're you're reading about People. real people who have yes. flaws and make mistakes and this story about adam adam is so wonderful and his only problem in the world is eve and if eve were just better and more pure then i don't know adam would be a mini god right that is not the perception i think jews have of adam i agree yeah, I did not care for this story's characterization of Adam and Eve as people. I didn't even like the part, and this goes, I guess, the epitome of what you said, that Satan's whole reason for doing what he did in the garden was that God told him, or no, God didn't. Michael, so one of the other angels told him that he had to worship Adam because he was made in God's image. And that that seemed off right there that not not a jewish thought right then and there and no wonder satan did what he did right yeah yeah Yeah, there are jewish like there's jewish midrash about uh the angels i don't know they they're mad at god or or they're snooty about the creation of humans because like what do you mean they're created in your image we came first yeah um but but i've never the the idea that the angels were expected to worship adam as an image of god i mean it's sort of anti the first commandment right right, right. like you exactly. have no other before me. image before me image before me yeah exactly like, including other people exactly well, we don't have the first commandment yet do we well they didn't yet but i'm just saying yeah. if a timeless like god that. held that value then oh he, that god wouldn't want the angels to be worshiping humans uh, the other thing i didn't like was was then uh, Satan blaming Adam and Eve because he wouldn't do what he was told. You know, he didn't take responsibility for his own choice. Right. Or also, to say he like- He apparently had freedom of choice and he chose something that displeased God. And then he blames Adam and Eve. It's like, you know, it's like blaming poor people for being poor. Well, I thought it was more like, so if, if Satan holds to his own values that worshiping a human was wrong, then being unfairly punished for it, like even if he doesn't take responsibility of his own because he feels it's unfair, it's still not actually Adam or Eve's fault. It's Michael or God's fault. So it's still, it's misplaced blame. And and he, and it's not so much that he thinks it's going against, you know, his values that God is the only one who should be worshiped. He's mad that somebody's better than him then. Yes. Right. All of a sudden. Right. Well, and so that, right. I mean, But this is the thing I think also that is so different in the conception of Satan, the Jewish Satan versus Christian Satan, is that in the Jewish Midrash around like the angels 
like reacting to Adam's creation, all of the angels feel that way. Like they're all like there's a, a unity of voices. It doesn't, I don't think it names any, but it just says like the heavenly hosts were jealous of the humans or of Adam. And so like I think that points to that in Judaism, the Satan is is a distinct voice, but not an inherently evil or fallen angel, but is one of the heavenly hosts. Yeah, well, he does say in 16.1, God got angry with me and sent me forth with my angels from our glory. On your account, we were expelled from our dwelling in this in, into this world and cast out upon the earth. So he had a bunch of angels with him in this version also, but you're right, he's blaming, he's not taking... There were gangs. Yeah. <laughs> he's yeah, he doesn't take responsibility take that he made a choice. Yeah. I feel like blaming Adam the, this way, to me it's like, you know, a scorned partner that blames the mistress or the whatever instead of the partner that cheated like if if he thinks he was so wronged again it's god or michael that have wronged him adam is just the object right which which I guess shows part of his negative attributes. Right, that he doesn't know how to stand by his values or like, oh, right. that it wasn't actually about values, it was about the object. It was more petty jealousy than like actual indignation. Right, because he and Michael could have had a duel. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and even the idea of arch archangels, that there are there's a hierarchy. hierarchy among the angels, is sort of a I don't know weird concept. It is. It was pretty common in Second Temple Judaism, or not late Second Temple Judaism. If it, uh, what period did I say? Like the Hellenistic era, um, I think is what I read. Um, had a lot of angels and demons um, in their world. But it's not, not something that really stuck for Jews, I feel. Except sometimes in the Kabbalah. But even then, it's, I, it changed shape significantly, I think. Also, um, it seemed interesting to me that, you know, related to Adam's place that uh, even Eve refers to him, or when she addresses him, she says, my Lord. Yeah. And it started way back then. Yeah. There's also some line about she's created to do his bidding. Yes. Right. Well, that that's why he had to be punished, too, for her sin. Because, like... Cause he, oh, that's what it was, because he didn't control his woman. Yeah. <laughs> you had one job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <You control her. laughs> Yeah, I don't know. do without this one. It sounds like we're, um, we're kind of in all in agreement that this was not an edifying. Uh, yeah. Yes. Agreed. I would take more about Seth too. I feel like I, these all give us a little bit more of Seth's voice than the Tanakh does. The like he just basically comes up in the 
genealogy and like that we know our line continues through him because Cain goes to the east and is wicked and Abel's dead. So Seth is the, and, and then there are other children, but they don't matter. Um, but then it doesn't like, we don't get anything about Seth, just that his line becomes the primary one. And then we have more genealogy that leads to Noah. Um, and so, so I kind of liked this like story of the journey that Eve and Seth take together of, you know, looking for this ointment for, for his father's pain. But I wish like that too. I mean, it's written in a biblical way, very terse, short on details, but I would have gladly taken less about the angels and more about like Seth, just what, what does he make of all this? What, how do you live with being the primary child of the first two people who have ever lived? Like that can't be an easy uh, role, like born to replace the one that was murdered. Sounds like something Jody Pico would write. Um, <laughs> but I mean, you would think, and I know so much was lost in the sands of time, but you'd think somebody would have said, well, where did all of these people come from? And written a story about, you know, who did Seth marry to have 30, if he's the right. one that had 30 children and 30. And it's, you'd think right. somebody would have, would have tried to answer that question. Yeah. Yes, that would have made a more interesting apocryphal. Nice. Yeah, this one just added more numbers, but it didn't give us any more insight onto where they came from. Or where they went. Or where they went. You have that problem after Noah, too, because who's left? Right. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> right. He had three sons. Um, Mermaids. They, they weren't, they didn't drown. <laughs> well, the movie tried to deal with that a little bit, that movie Noah. <laughs> right. Does that count right. as a proper fight of Noah? <laughs> Mid Josh. Uh, I like that movie. <laughs> yeah, I, did, I did too. And the only difference between, well, not the only difference, but the a main difference between Apocrypha and Midrash then would be when it was written. Yeah, I think that's what I'm I'm getting from this. Um, I I think Apocrypha seems to have been written with some intention to be canonized. Um, whereas Midrash was written more like self-aware of its um, sort of secondary place in the authoritative hierarchy of Jewish text, you know? So it would sort of been fun if there had been like a gossip columnist whose writings uh, <laughs> had survived about how, you know, how, who was making the rules and how the meetings were held and, yeah, I, mean, I, get, is... I get why this wasn't included. First of all, because most of it was written like a thousand, two thousand years later. Right. <laughs> um, but, you know, who were these people that were making these decisions? And Right. The problem is that. Were they the early rabbis? The majority the of priests. the priests people couldn't read or write. So the only records we have are the people who were vying for that authoritative position. So there's right. no there's no one keeping track of like the different sides because they each kind of pretended they were the only one. 
I think these stories were created to share with the pagans that, that certain people were converting because they were used to these beautiful stories of the gods and goddesses of the Greek slash Roman pantheon. And they needed something equally glamorous to tell them. Mm -hmm. But we're not those people. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, what? Agreed. Agreed. Not a Greek. Agreed. A Greek. <laughs> Maybe both. So for next time, next time. Let, what? I'm no, just. No, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so for our last uh, example of um, apocrypha, let's look at Ben Sira slash Ecclesiasticus, because that we know is definitely Jewish. It's like been held in pretty high esteem um, as far as non-canonical texts go in Jewish communities. It's available on um, Safaria and it's in my book. So I'll have, I'll have the details for you. Does that sound okay? Mm -hmm. Tell me the name again. Um, I read the, the first part. Ben Sira. Sometimes Ben Sirach, sometimes Ecclesiasticus. He goes by many names. We'll get a link. Right. What? And we'll get a link. Yeah. Uh, what? Yeah. Uh, you, know, you guys, you seem to me that you are more familiar with the Tanakh than I am. And so it might benefit me to read some of the stuff side by side. Oh wait, Ben Sira is not actually translated on Safaria. Oh, some of it is. All right, let me see if I can find another online translation. I have to download Safari. It, well, it's, you can just use a web browser. You could, give, you, give, you gave Mario a link last year, didn't you? I, I just remember that discussion. With Mario. There's 51 chapters in Safari. How much more do you want us to read? <laughs> There's 51 chapters? Are they short or long? I didn't measure them. I'm just telling you. Because <laughs> this one had quite a few chapters. Um, well, verses. All right, we'll figure it out. Alphabet of Sirach. That is a different work, but I think I get them confused sometimes. You can read it in the Greek. Okay. <laughs> That's Greek to me. That's all Greek to me. Um, okay, would do would you rather pick <clears throat> a shorter one? Well, if this is one that that's you know at the top of the list, we could read part of it. Okay. Get the gist. All right. So then why don't you let's let's stick with what's on Safaria. There are huge chunks that are not translated, but as, um, or not huge chunks, but like a couple chapters. Um, as Juliet says, it is 51 chapters, so you'll still get a gist. Um, and I'll, I'll read this fully English annotated version, so I'll fill in the gaps for you. Is this? Whoa. Ooh. <laughs> I, I found this other website. It doesn't appear to actually have any English uh, translations. So it's not really that helpful. 
but it has pictures of the actual manuscripts from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Ooh, wow. That's kind of cool. Where are the Dead Sea Scrolls? Where are they? Yeah. Good good question. Probably like the British Museum or someplace of that. Mm -hmm. We saw that. some of them in Jerusalem and which which museum? Mm. But we did see some. They had some in cases that you could look at in Jerusalem. I don't know if they have them all or if anybody has them all. Probably. Right. They've probably been scholars have that. Museum. Museum. Yeah. 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 museum exhibitions and displays. Oh, they travel. <clears throat> Um, is there a small fragment in the, in the name of the Bible? Yeah, the Israel Museum. The Israel Museum had it for a while. Various museums in the United States and the UK. Um, the Jordan Archaeological Museum. And that's it. That's what it says. And the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. Okay. <laughs> Which doesn't exist yes. anymore. I don't think. Hmm. All right. This is interesting. In 2018, the Museum of the Bible announced that five of its 16 Dead Sea Scroll fragments are probably modern forgeries. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. That was after the museum of the Bible is a trip. <laughs> it's it's worth the trip. It was a neat I was skeptical, but we went and I I thought it was a worth the visit. But yeah, but you have to the way they got a lot of their stuff and, and some of it's been declared forgeries and it, it's interesting. Yep. Let's see scrolls at the Museum of the Bible are all forgeries. Oh, museum founder is Steve Green, who owns the Hobby Lobby. So there you go. <laughs> um, okay. Great. Then we will discuss <laughs> other reason not to shop there. Ben Sira, Sira, Ecclesiasticus. Whatever you want to call them. Next. As far as we get. As far as you get. All right. See you then. Bye. Take care. Bye. Have a good week, everybody. Bye bye. Ciao. Bye.